Okay, welcome back to all participants for the session number seven of our Food Trucks Research Summit. I'm glad to have here with us Alana Award from North Carolina State University, US. And now we will talk about food tourism and web specifically. And uh, I invite her and I leave you, of course, the screen and also the, the speech for her presentation entitled Better Bide, Food Tourism in the Digital Age. Thank you very much, Alana, for being here and welcome. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate it. Good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining my presentation. My name is Elena Howard and I'm a first year graduate student at NC State University in a, uh, an interdisciplinary program called the Masters of Arts and Liberal Studies. My focus is on sustainable tourism, so I'm interested in the intersection of uh, how we can better equip destinations to prepare for tourists, determine what's sustainable and healthy for them as a destination, and assessments and tools that can be used to prevent over tourism. Uh, this is my first academic conference ever. I'm, I'm a first year graduate student. So uh, thank you for joining my presentation and I welcome any feedback or questions at the end because I have a long journey in front of me and a lot to learn. And I know there's a, a well-respected audience um, in, this, in this program. I have over a decade of experience in digital marketing. And so my topic today is a synthesis. It's an analysis of existing work on the intersection of digital media and food tourism. And um, outside of, of this presentation, I'm preparing some original research, both from the food tourist perspective and also the food provider perspective on how the internet and social media have disrupted um, typical channels in food tourism. So the purposes of this discussion, I'm, I'm focusing in on defining ourselves as food tourists and do we eat better now than we did before? So through this lens, we define better as creating more positive trip experiences and increasing memorability throughout a trip and, and increasing overall pleasurable experiences related to food. In terms of timing for this definition, before would be before the invention of the internet. So if we look at the timing when around the early 1970s, that's when the internet was first invented. But of course, it's not until the 1990s, early 2000s that it's become more widely available, especially in high income economies. Um, and so the, the time frame for the purposes of this analysis is from the early 1990s up through uh, today as, as far as after. So before we can start to answer this question and determine the impact of the internet on a food tourist and, and determine if we eat better than we did before the internet was invented, let's, let's spend some time defining and examining what constitutes a food tourist. So first, Williams describes it well, summarizes it well, and describing food tourists as those who search for authentic culinary experiences when traveling locally, regionally, or internationally. So note that, that there's not a, a distance requirement related to food tourism. It can be local in the community next door, it can be across the globe. But these sorts of authentic culinary experiences need to be educational, they need to be engaging, enriching, and, and preferably hands-on when available. And overall, Williams highlights the importance of food tourism for experiences where food is viewed and valued for its celebration of culture and its potential economic impact. So when we think about the types of experiences that food tourists are looking to curate nowadays, a lot of them map to those, those adjectives early in that definition. The second area of focus comes to, it refers to options. So Quan and Wang found that food consumption during travel can drive higher trip satisfaction rates by producing a sense of enjoyment and satisfaction. So having more options and preferably with, when they're authentic, locally sourced, either hands-on or culturally enriching, 
that increase in options is another key factor um, of importance to a food tourist. And then personalization. So in 2010, the World Food Tourism Association, our host for today, did some interesting research on over 11,000 consumers and food lovers from over 100 countries and condensed these into 13 primary persona types. So this helps both from a marketing and from an identification standpoint on behalf of a food tourist identify themselves and start to research and select experiences that are personalized to their interests. So that benefits both the provider and, and the consumer. Yi talks about three different stages when a food tourist is creating their ideal, um, their ideal experience on, on a trip. The three stages are organic, induced, and experiential. And that organic image develops through our normal assimilation with, with content and media. So it could be offline content, it could be online media, and increasingly it's becoming more and more um, heavily swayed by what we see online. So as we think about, are we eating better now in the age of the internet than we did before as a food tourist? These are three key areas um, that affect all three of those stages, but especially that organic stage, because as somebody's curating what, what feels right to them, what they're interested in valuing on a trip, um, these three factors are especially important in that organic stage. And that's where we start to see some of the biggest impact uh, from the internet. So pre-internet, so before the standard marketing to a food tourist was very one directional. So in that organic stage, we're heavily influenced by traditional media. The sender, the flow, the flow of information from the sender to a food tourist was very, um, very one dimensional. So it, when we think about things like in country happening upon uh, an opportunity to have a food experience, that's a that's a very small percentage of um, the overall marketing that might happen, that's much more direct and, and influenced by the destination that happens later than the organic stage. But for everything else, if we think about tour guides, magazines, brochures, all of the historically print media that were used to market tourism experiences, those are very one directional. So from the source of information to the consumer. And this flow was pretty common, um, not just in food tourism, but in the larger the, the industry overall and in most forms of marketing. So Wally lists many different types, but the, the ones that are we're most familiar with are travel agents, travel books, travel guides, magazines, brochures, that sort of thing. There's that distribution channel that brings the information about the food experience, shapes the description of it, um, their definition of what's authentic or engaging starts to influence the material um, and the consumers, the food tourists are, are influenced by that. Now with the internet that has changed pretty dramatically. So we've diminished that traditional sender's role. It's not one dimensional anymore um, as defined by Williams, but as that sender's role diminishes, it creates a large void, which exerts a pretty dramatic um, but not necessarily obvious impact on the people who are accessing that information. So I'll, that, that void has been filled by many different types of content, but on the internet and with social media, it's been primarily filled by user-generated content or consumer-generated media, um, also social media sites. So now food tourists are receiving information from many more sources than, than in pre-internet standards. Um, and so, as we create more user-generated content and as, be, as food tourists become more accustomed to using that as a source of information to develop their organic image, it starts to raise the credibility of user-generated content. So it's become much more common to accept information from a peer through a blog, through a comment on a YouTube channel, through a social media site than it would have been um, in the early stages of the internet, and obviously it was non-existent before the internet. So this shift in how we send and receive information creates some really unique opportunities for food tourism providers to market themselves and to share information about their unique value proposition. 
And then on behalf of the food tourists, we're starting to con consume information from all these different sources and starting to create new processes for validating and ranking this information. So what's so important about user-generated content? It's, it's especially important in that it allows people to freely express their feelings about products, brands, or experiences. So when we think about those one-dimensional sources of information, that is heavily editorialized. There might be um, uh, financial implications for some of those media types. Um, travel agents were incentivized by, by some of the destinations or the, the people providing um, incentives for those, uh, for those experiences. But with user-generated content, there's a wider lens, a wider opportunity for people to share directly their own input that isn't um, necessarily sponsored or editorialized or motivated by other factors driven by revenue. Consumer-generated media is also prevalent across sites like TripAdvisor, so being able to speak directly to other um, food tourists and, and overall tourists um, about points of view and perspectives. And it gives users a direct voice to speak with each other um, and, and offer their opinion. So a few different examples of sites that allow this peer-to-peer -peer sharing and how these um, have changed the way that we consume or create ideas about our food experiences. Uh, the, we might take it for granted, but things like Google Translate, that allows somebody to surpass language barriers and understand an even more local point of view in somebody's native language about a potential food experience. Sites like Eat With or Traveling Spoon provide a peer-to-peer -peer booking opportunity so you can connect with people in a destination and um, experience potentially a cultural angle, not only a food aspect of a food experience, it invited into homes and have, uh, as they define it, local cuisine directly with somebody cooking it out of, out of their own space. So there isn't a commercial angle to that. The industrial franchise model is removed and it's direct peer to peer from two people, the website simply providing that platform. And then other sites like Urban Adventures, same concept, allow people to book tours, food tours and experience markets, experience cooking classes and experience those hands, those hands on and culinary aspects from uh, what would be considered a local in, in that environment, um, which would not be something that would be as easily accessed prior to the internet. So it really opens up the opportunity for people to connect with people in a way that wasn't as easily possible before. And so as we think about users creating, food tourists creating that organic image, what do I want to experience when I go to my destination? What does authentic look like? What does local look like? They're using all of these types of media to, um, to answer those questions and to determine what their values are and important to them on a trip. So it's, um, it's, it, it's becoming an increasingly large aspect of that organic research stage. If we think about before those traditional sources, things like a guidebook um, or a tour agent, those are probably much more narrow um, lists of options for food experiences, and they're, they might be more directed on things like restaurants. Um, the the peer-to-peer -peer angle wasn't nearly as, um, it didn't feature ne nearly as heavily in the, um, in the availability of those food experiences. So if we return to this implication that food tourists eat better when there are, are fresh, accessible, maybe authentic options that aren't corporate or industrial, and they have more options to research and, and encounter these experiences, then the internet is definitely playing a larger role in that, um, in that availability. Of course, it's the internet, as even we saw as recently last week with the Facebook, WhatsApp, um, and Instagram outage, the internet is um, not, it's not all good online. Um, the, there are many different societal impacts. Lynn highlights the fact that the internet can be driving um, some substantial negative change at the individual level, 
Um, Madrigal points out that there are increased levels of um, decline in, um, in, in voter understanding and false information, which is starting to lead to uh, doubts, in, at least in Western democracy, about the effectiveness of democratic government. Um, and then, of course, CDA 230, it, it has allowed a lot of companies to potentially get off the hook for the information that's on their website. So it absolves the, the provider of the content that they have on their platform. This is featured heavily in the debates around Facebook and what role it's playing in modern society. Uh, the idea that our information is being owned or it's, it's on the platform, it's not our own anymore. So when Facebook is unaccessible, that communication is obviously cut off versus something like an email list, which is more, it's, it's directly owned media, still relying on the internet, but it's not relying on that third party platform. Um, and then there are things like social, like sponsored content. So we've seen a rise in uh, sponsored content and it raises questions about authenticity and what are the motivating factors behind that content. That's nothing new. I mean, we saw as early as the, the 1800s with Brilliant Severin, who was a French lawyer and politician. He wrote The uh, phil Physiology of Taste, at least in French food culture. He was one of what we might think of as an original French in food culture influencer. So he was provided access to restaurants and food experiences for free in order to, to dine and to give a review either in either with his friends in his network or in a print publication after that. So the idea of exchanging food experiences for, um, for press isn't new, but the, uh, the internet has obviously expanded the, the availability of that and does call into question sometimes the labeling and what's appropriate. Um, I think with an increase in digital literacy and regulations, we can continue to balance that, but it's, it's of course, not something to be ignored. Um, the internet is, it's not all positive. But when we think back to food tourists and, you, and if they're able to eat better now in the age of the internet than they were before, I think there's a couple of key areas to focus on. This channel disruption is big. So if we think about other areas of tourism, for example, flying, the internet enables you to book a ticket on an airline, but the provider and the ultimate act, you're, you're still flying with the same company that you were before the internet. So the means of access has changed, but it's still Delta's plane. It's still Aer Lingus's plane. Um, the means with which you've, you've registered and bought uh, their product has, has shifted. But in the case of food tourism, this peer-to-peer -peer network is vastly different. Now, pretty much anybody with the right criteria according to the platform can make themselves available as a food tourism provider or do research as a food tourist consumer and surpass things like language with Google Translate. And because there aren't any overarching um, rules in how people communicate, you can communicate with people that might not have had access to these sorts of experiences in the past. So there's sort of a socioeconomic implication there because you're talking to just the wider internet um, it's not the same people that you would have had access to before in your, in your more narrow social circle. Um, and then things that are common across social media and the internet at large, hashtags, right? They, they allow us to find a topic um, and surpass the platform. So you don't even necessarily have to have the platform access. You can use things like a hashtag to um, communicate with topics of interest. This has come up a lot recently um, locally with, with, we saw it with food trucks, but each new trend in food tourism, I think there's obviously a hashtag associated with that and it allows people to see what the larger conversation is around that topic. So this intersection of blog content, video content, social media content, it's all under this umbrella of user generated. And I think that's really uniquely positioned to help food tourists connect locally or internationally um, with food tourism providers. So as we wrap up, um, we're, we're headed into the, the period for questions, but I think that this channel disruption is, is one of the key takeaways here. So the idea that food tourists 
as they're researching that organic stage, they have so many more sources of information and, and areas of input than they did before the internet. Um, on the whole, the internet definitely has challenges with what could be unobjective or personalized content um, discussions around who owns content and who has the right to determine what a, what a fair and credible source is. These are all important areas that, that shouldn't be ignored or dismissed. Um, I think continuing to train on digital literacy, proper usage of the internet, and holding, holding companies accountable for how they profit from the content on their platforms is especially important. But the, the internet really enables food tourists to have increased options, determine what fits their areas of interest, uh, provide their own voice in food tourism by leaving reviews and, and sharing information back to the provider. And so overall, I think we, we, can, uh, we can assert that food tourists, because of the internet, are better positioned to curate trip experiences that, that drive and increase their levels of positive uh, trip satisfaction. Um, in, in future work, I'm also interested in sort of the reverse angle, so doing research on micro-entrepreneurism opportunities for food providers. How has the internet enabled them to reach a wider audience than they were um, prior, to the, prior to the internet? That's the end of my talk for today. I appreciate your time and attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Alana, for your presentation. I think that you provide a, an exhaustive overview of the linkages between food, tourism, and the internet. And uh, it is a very interesting question at the end, do we food tourists it better now than before? And then uh, I think that you are now trying to give an answer in your study to this question, is it right? So we have one question or maybe it is more I also suggestions because one of our attendees asked something about the bloggers and influencers because of course they can uh, influence our decision about food and also food tourism. He or she said that uh, maybe there are many comments and also opinion that comes from non-expert and connoisseurs in the specific field. So um, what do you think about it and how can you discern this difference? Because of course, internet, as you said, can help us to, to do a more conscious choice, but of course uh, we, are not fully aware that all the information are completely true. Yes, I think this, this relates strongly back to that concept of sponsored content, right? The rise of the influencer yeah. as somebody who is motivated financially to put a certain lens or a certain light on an experience. And I think that we're in a healthier place now than we were a few years ago. It's the, from a platform perspective, influencers are starting to become more required to indicate when their content is sponsored. We're seeing this especially on YouTube and Instagram. I think the traction is could be improved a little bit more. Um, ultimately, though, the access to the information, even having that access is important. I think that it, even if it's stylizing an ideal state, um, it, it could be misrepresenting exactly what the food tourist experience is. That's definitely um, not to be ignored, but having the access overall, I think, is even a step in the right direction. And so this idea that platforms are starting to require people to call out when they're benefiting from sponsored content puts the onus, puts the the action or maybe even the responsibility back on the food tourist who's trying to create that organic image because they're now recognizing this might not be exactly as it's being laid out to me. So there's, but there's still opportunity to do additional research 
to validate, is this what I'm seeing? Is this authentic? Is this local? What are other people saying in the conversation around this? Um, can I find more information to validate if this is right for me or not? Um, subjective, yes, but I think every food tourism experience ultimately is subjective. How we each define authentic, although there's definitely common standards around authenticity, what each person is looking for is unique to them. So it's, it's also up to them to determine, is this content appropriate for my vision, my organic image of a trip? of a food experience, or is it, um, is it so heavily influenced that this is not something that is realistic to me? You know, this is just not accessible and, and doesn't meet my criteria. It's back to that individual value judgment. Yeah, thank you. As also Eric wrote, uh, the experience, as you said, is, can be defined authentically mine because it's my perspective and my experience. Okay, thank you very much, Alan, for your intervention and your speech. And uh, of course, we're ending this session and we we'll see in a couple of minutes for the last one. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you very you, much, Alan. Bye to everyone.